All right, welcome everybody to our next lecture on the Fabids. This is one of the two major groups of rosids, which is the large group of eudicots, primarily um, with free petals, right? Not fused. And here are the families that we're gonna cover uh, today. Uh, it can look like a lot, I feel that, um, but it's okay. There's two huge ones, the Rose ACE and the Fab ACE. The other ones are fairly modest in size. And you can see that they are spread across many different orders. Uh, what we're not covering in the Zygophilales, that includes um, creosote, which is an important plant in the Southwest. And the Oxalidales has lots of interesting things, including shamrocks. And the Celestraceae, uh, uh, nothing that interesting there. So we'll cover lots of stuff um, within the other five orders of the Fabids. And I've arranged these not so much by orders, but by kind of broad types to hopefully ease uh, learning ability. Okay, so the first group of species that I'm massing together are deciduous angiosperm trees that are in this clade. The first family we're gonna talk about is the Salicaceae or the willows and poplars. Um, fairly species rich, particularly within the genus Salix or the willows. Um, there's lots of species of willows here in Colorado and I find these to be really hard to identify. Uh, we'll also talk about aspens. And these all share a really important secondary compound, salicins or salicylic acid, um, from which we get a lot of um, pain mitigation. Indeed, aspirin was, was originally derived from this. Okay, the genus Salix. Um, these are dioecious trees. So you have an, an individual that is entirely female and an individual that's entirely male of all the species uh, found in temperate regions with highly reduced down flowers. And that's gonna be a trend we're gonna see in the various uh, angiosperm deciduous trees that we're talking about is really, really, really tiny flowers. Um, some are going to be pollinated by the wind, but some will retain insect pollination and some sort of nominal uh, nectar reward. Um, speaking of, here are like nectar glands that you could see just tiny little things at the base of the bracts um, of the ament of a male or even on a female uh, flower here in some various willows. Uh, the fruit type is going to be a capsule, so dry and dehissing, and then cottony seeds for wind dispersal. Um, we'll see that in particular in the true cottonwoods. Now, many species of Salix are what are termed precocious, meaning that they do their entire sexual phase of flowering and pollination prior to flushing out the leaves in the spring. So some of the earliest signs of spring in various areas are things like seeing pussy willows, um, which would be again, the aments, also known as the catkins of these various species of willows. Here are some pictures of just a few of our native species. Um, I don't know if you can see, but um, when you're driving around in Colorado, particularly in the high elevation kind of flatlands or the parks as they're called, um, various areas with like a little bit of localized water, sometimes we get very thick kind of willow based wetlands are uh, great habitat for moose, um, people that graze cattle, etc. Willow thickets are really important. And there's lots of different species that are found there. Um, some of these definitely get up very high into the alpine. Um, and indeed, uh, there are definitely some indigenous plant names and uses that you can see here from the Navajo related to the coyote willow, which is in fact smoked. I'm going to hide the floating meeting there. Okay, cool. So some of ours, you notice they're going to really different, differ in leaf shape. So there's going to be a lot of vegetative features you have to get comfortable with to key out a willow. I hate keying willows. Okay, 
a smaller genus, but similarly important um, in our state and many other places are the poplars, cottonwoods, and aspens in the genus, genus populus. Similarly, we have males and females. Um, you can see the different kinds of uh, flowers here of populus deltoides, our American cottonwood. And then here's what it looks like. Now, the base of these flowers is going to be very disc-like, so kind of like a hypanthium, but again, we don't have obvious petals and sepals. So that's kind of of floral origin, but without obvious petals and sepals. And their subtending it is a very distinctive bract. And there is again the cottony seeds that you're going to get from the female trees. Um, beloved to everyone, yeah, let's go with everybody in Colorado loves the trembling aspen or populus tremuloides. Um, you know, huge, massive clonal populations coming up from root sprouts. Um, in fact, groves of aspen have been postulated to be some of the oldest living things in the whole wide world, if you consider them all one genetic individual coming up over and over again over centuries. Um, certainly very important, you know, succession stories with fire, kind of wars with gymnosperms in the high country, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there are other species, uh, Populus grandidentata, the big tooth aspen, which is just not as common as the trembling. And then we have several species that are at lower elevation, really um, confined to riparian areas. Populus deltoides with the big triangular or delta-like leaf. And then the narrow leaf cottonwood, Populus angustifolia with a much more willow-like leaf and a name from the Ute people for it. Okay, another fabid family with really important trees is the Phagaceae. This includes the oaks, which are of enormous global importance and very, very species rich, as well as smaller groups, the beeches and the chestnuts, which are also ecologically important. And, you know, many of the plants we're going to talk about, elms and chestnuts in particular, um, here in North America, um, prior to, I don't know, depends on which origin of the diseases, but you know, 200 years ago, the forest composition, particularly in the eastern United States, was very different than it is now before various plant diseases came over from the old world and decimated um, various species, including the American chestnut. Uh, luckily, we have very healthy local species, Quercus gamblii, the gambles oak which is incredibly common, a keystone species, definitely a species to know here in Colorado. We're going to see stands of this all over in the foothills ecosystem. The acorns are a very important food source for lots of animals. Um, we will maybe hopefully see them flowering out and fruiting. They have like kind of a some like boom years and bust years for acorns, um, which really is going to impact all the animals that utilize them for food. An acorn itself is a nut. So that is a dry indehiscent fruit. And all of these different bracts at the base of the female uh, flower coalesce into the adorable woody cup at the base of that nut. So a little cap on the acorn, which I find quite adorable. Um, what are some other things I could say about Quercus? So much. Um, acorns from different species of oaks have been a very, very important source of food for indigenous Americans. Um, they know how to pound this into a flour and leach water through it to remove some of the really kind of um, bad tasting secondary compounds and turn it into a nice flower for making all kinds of edible um, things. Um, botanists are really challenged by this group. There is really fuzzy species limits on various groups of oaks. Oaks readily hybridize. It's a real big challenge group that I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole, but I do love the gamble oak. Okay, and finally we have the Betulaceae or the birch and hazelnut family. Similarly, we're going to have separate male and female, though 
we have on the same individual. So this would be like an example of monoecious, the paper birch that we see here. Um, and yet again, when you have clusters of single sexed flowers that are highly reduced down, that's called an ament or a catkin. No showy perianth whatsoever in this group. And the fruit is going to be called a samara, which is like an indehiscent um, fruit with a papery wing to mediate um, wind dispersal. And they often have this very char characteristic um, three lobed bract, as we see from hazelnuts here. Birches, they're a lot smaller, but you can look for it. Here in Colorado, again, exclusive to um, riparian zones, particularly in the montane and higher elevation ecosystems, you get two important genera, the birches, which is the genus Betula, and alder, which is the genus Alnus. Um, they're gonna have some of that really kind of deciduous bark, um, not the true paper bark that you get out east and farther north from here, but they have that bark that kind of peels off in a really nice way. Obviously other species, that's been very important for canoe building, housing, paper, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the main way that I can tell you to tell the two genera apart, Betula and Alnus, is is the pistillate catkin or the female catkin, is it deciduous and falls apart or is it tough and persistent? So that's kind of an analogous um, character when we remember back to um, Abies versus Picea, right? Abies with the deciduous female cone and Picea with the persistent cone, right? So same thing here. So we'll look for those in various um, mountain wetland conditions, particularly um, on high slopes as opposed to on the flatlands, like you get willows. Um, a couple other trees of note, especially because they contain noxic weeds, the Eliagnaceae. Okay, this is a very, you know, small family globally um, of trees that fix nitrogen. So we're going to talk about the Fabaceae, which is a nitrogen fixer, but there's lots of other species out there that fix nitrogen as well in the roots. So this is one of them. Um, and it has these very distinctive silvery or reddish uh, glandular hairs on the leaves. They just glow. Um, we'll see that in the field. This is an important one to know because Russian olive, which is the common name, was planted all over Colorado and it is a class two listed, um, class B listed noxious weed in Colorado and an important one to get rid of. Here's kind of a gross story. Um, I used to do urban forestry, um, so taking care of trees in parks in my hometown of Loveland, Colorado. And there are Russian olives all over the place. And they produce a little hard olive, essentially, um, though they're not in the olive family, but like a fleshy fruit. And um, Norwegian rats, which are huge, would climb up in the trees at night to snack on those. So ugh. anyways, it's a very, very hard plant to get rid of once it has moved into your yard. Same with Siberian elm, Ulmus pumila, which is a Colorado noxious weed, watchless, so less severely bad than Russian olive, but a problem. It's in the Ulmaceae or the elm family. And again, out east, beautiful species like the American elm, Ulmus americana shown here, have been decimated by Dutch elm disease. Um, the main way you can tell the genus Ulmus is the base of the leaves is asymmetrical. You can see that here. It's not as obvious in our Siberian elm, but you can see it. And the fruit is gonna be a little Samara, like we saw in some of the other kind of ones. It's not gonna be as obvious as like a maple, but kind of has two wings down at the tip. Okay, so that's kind of it for the trees without showy flowers. Now we're going to move into more of kind of the wildflowers. So this is the Violaceae or the violet family. 
Um, and here in the temperate um, latitudes, these are adorable little spring wildflowers like pansies or Johnny jump ups that you might have seen as bedding plants. However, in the tropics, these form trees, vines, um, there's a, you should see what these things do in Hawaii. There's an amazing um, adaptive radiation of the genus Viola within Hawaii. So kind of a cool theme that some lineages that look kind of all the same vegetatively in temperate ha habitats in the tropics do really, really interesting things. Okay. Um, there's lots of species of viola um, in North America. This is again to me a pretty hard group to key out. One of the key features again is going to be are the leaves all basal coming from the base or are there calling leaves along a main stem? And then thinking about the lobing on the leaves, is it chordate with a heart-shaped base or is it palmately lobed or divided? Um, so this is like a little sandy prairie violet with highly palmately lobed leaves. Um, very obvious stipules in violets. Um, we've talked about stipules in other groups as well. Okay, so this is again gonna be another five Maris plant. Um, fives, fives, and fives, uh, highly zygomorphic. I can't think of a single actinomorphic violet. Um, the lowermost petal is going to be spurred, which is something we've seen in Ranunculaceae. This group could do that spurring as well. Um, the two lower stamen have spurs going back into it as well. So you have multiple layers of spurring there. And then the gynoecium is made of three fused carpels and it is superior. So that's an interesting point, right? The base on the gynoecium is more like a monocot number, but everything else is fives, fives, fives. Okay, the fruit, the mature fruit will be a capsule. So dry and dehiscent and it's full of seeds here. Now that's what we find in what are called chasmogamous flowers that were above ground, showy and pretty and are involved in outcrossing. They must receive pollen from other. Now violets do this crazy thing where many species have a second set of flowers that literally only open underground and they pollinate themselves underground and they form a small little capsule like this and the seeds just disperse there underground. So the second set of flowers is called Cleistogamous, which is super crazy. So if you're ever in a place where someone has like a lawn with a bunch of violets in it, kind of weedy violets, especially if you're out east, go ahead and dig one up and see if you can find these weird ghost flowers underground that are cleistogamous. Um, here is a couple of our local violets, Viola sororia, very common in kind of understory conditions throughout North America. Viola padatafida, which is an endemic to prairie violet with a very different kind of leaf. Okay, now we move on to the Euphorbiaceae or the Spurge family. This is a very important family globally. Lots of trees and shrubs, particularly in the tropics, particularly in highly uh, xeric conditions. So in the new world um, deserts, right, kind of the big family you might think of is the cactus, the cactus family, which we'll talk about. In the old world, particularly in Africa, the Mediterranean, et cetera, the big family that is cactus-like is the Euphorbiaceae there. So lots of cool convergent evolution going on in the Euphorbiaceae. <laughs> What's shown here is ricinus, castor oil and also the source of ricin poison. This group is chock full of some incredibly nasty chemicals, um, straight up poisons for sure, as well as some things that we really need. Uh, rubber, um, so before we could produce rubber industrially, it had to come from trees of the tropics and there's really interesting ethnobotanical stories about kind of 
quests for rubber, um, especially during World War II, and botanists trying to find more and more sources of rubber. Um, airplanes in particular needed non-synthetic rubber for their tires. And so there was like a global hunt for rubber to kind of shape who was going to win the war. Uh, tapioca is in this group, as well as the poinsettia, which is native to Mexico and has become an important um, horticultural plant. The leaves are alternate, simple, sometimes palmately lobed or palmately compound, not ever pinnately. Okay, these things have real crazy flowers. Now at first pass, they don't actually look that interesting. Um, many times with the U4BAC, we get very excited at looking at the leaves, um, et cetera. The majority of the family is gonna have unisexual flowers with five sepals, no petals whatsoever. Some have many stamen. We'll talk about the case lower here with zeros. Uh, three fused carpels and capsular fruits. Okay. So the main genera that are very large um, here and in many parts of the world is the genus Euphorbia in the genus Camasyce, which we have here. And if you look in past kind of some showy bracts, you see something like what we see here. And it's like, what on earth is this weird thing in the center? Is this a flower or an inflorescence? Well, most of our flowering spurges that we have, have something that's really bizarre. It's called a highly modified inflorescence or a cyathium, a cluster of unisexual flowers reduced down to nothing. To me, it's like they used an inflorescence and aborted different parts and expanded different parts to kind of recreate a single flower. I don't know why evolution did that. That's super crazy. Um, okay, so in the upper here, this is Euphorbia marginata. This is one of many kind of really like nasty, like parking lot weeds, dry areas that you would see. This one's actually kind of pretty. Um, there's a number of species of this uh, here. And you see actually a lot of indigenous uses, particularly by the Navajo medicinally. Um, they know really how to use these safely. And that would be a very important thing because these really do have a lot of nasty compounds in them. Okay. So each of these like flower-like things is a cyathium. Now let's kind of dig into what's going on. So here's one cut through on the side. Okay, so two different species kind of showing some variation. The outermost thing, there's some glands. So there's a lot of recruitment of very small insects. Ants are often involved in these glands as well. And then to the outside of that is like a pretty appendage. So it's not even petals. It's just sort of like a modified leaf at the base of the gland that then secondarily takes on the role of petal. That's what I'm saying. Like, why not just use a regular flower? That's not what U4BAC did. What does it actually do with its flowers? Well, it has lots of, they're essentially whole flowers that's aborted every single thing except for a single stamen, which is crazy. You could look very early in development or look at what genes are being expressed, whatever, to see there was evidence of a true flower there, but everything dies off except for a stamen. And then we have a female flower, the exact same thing. Everything dies away except for this giant central pistil made up of three carpels with three little styles on it. That's so crazy. We do have some nice native spurges, but what I really want you to know are the highly invasive and noxious spurges. So there are multiple species that came from the old world that were brought over horticulturally. Predictably, because they do really well in dry gardens. They have this unbelievably cool like chartreuse kind of color to the inflorescence. But these are some of the worst of the worst of the worst weeds that are out there. So Euphorbia eschula here is the leafy spurge and it's a noxious list weed B. 
meaning that state agencies are developing plans to stop the spread of these. Um, we will see a patch of this in Garden of the Gods and you gotta rain down chemicals on this. You can't dig it out, you can't burn it out, you can't get a goat to eat it. It's essentially like you have to kill it with poisons. There are two other similar species, Euphorbia cyparesias and Mercenides, um, which are similar kind of green friends like this, that they're even worse. They're at list A. There's very few species in the state that hit list A noxious weed. But this is what like land managers look for to eradicate. And I see them all over town and I try and take them out when I can. You should too. Okay, now we're going to move on to the two monster families of the day, the Rosaceae and the Fabaceae. The Rosaceae is a globally important species, but particularly in the Northern Hemisphere temperate regions. And it's the source of many of our very most beloved commercial fruits. I'm talking apples, plums, peaches, cherries, strawberries, raspberries, almonds, uh, blackberries, what am I forgetting? Many of the most tasty things are in the Rosaceae. Um, they could be herbs, shrubs, or trees. The leaf arrangement is alternate. And they could be anywhere from simple, pinnately, palmately compound, kind of everything goes. The key thing to look here is well-developed stipules when there are compound leaves. And that's, again, this nice comparison point to the ranunculaceae, which will lack those big, obvious stipules. At first pass, the flowers are very similar. similar so this is a really good thing to look at. Okay, this is again a big group for having a hypanthium. So here you can see like a cut rose and that big cup right below the hypanthium, which actually develops into a rose hip, which is the name for the final fruit in the rose there. Um, we sometimes get bracts below the calyx in something like a uh, domesticated rose as well. base count of five on this with lots and lots of stamen. So we looked at things like the Saxifragaceae, Crashulaceae with, you know, very clear numbers of stamen. This one has lots of stamen. So not just like five or 10 or anything like that. The house of female, the Gynoecium is highly variable and used taxonomically to define subfamilies. Though actually over time we've learned it's way too variable to use taxonomically. And so a lot of that's being redone right now. So here's like the old four families, the subfamily Spireoidae, which is not monophyletic. The subfamilies Rosoidae, Prunoidae, and Maloidae. I'm not gonna really teach them because they're not used so much anymore, but I think this is an interesting depiction to show how these different flowers change. Okay, so things that we can notice here, again, is like what's going on with the hypanthium, right? And it's always there, but is it a complete flat thing, like a plate? And so you would have a superior gynoecium. Is it wrapped around it like a bowl? And that would be like... Um, that we see like in Rosa right here, or is it pressed on on the outside? Like, I don't know, what could I say? Like a vase that's so tight around it, like what you see in Apple. Um, so that's one thing that varies across the Rosaceae is where, what's the Hypanthium doing? Um, other things are, do we have lots of pistils, each made up of a single carpal, like that we see in Rosa or that we see in Strawberry? So this is Gynoecium apocarpic. That's what we mean there. Um, is there just one pistil made of one carpal, like we see in Cherry? That's monocarpic. Or do we actually have multiple carpals fused together? That's what we get in apple, a syncarpic gynoecium. There are then very specific fruit terms for each of those. These fruit terms are used in other families as well, right? 
We have fleshy fruits, including druplets, like we see in raspberries and strawberries. Um, we have very specific cherries, right? With that stone in the middle. Poem is a very lovely word for what's going on with an apple, right? In which we have multiple carpels fused, that's the core in the center, and a fleshy hypanthium around it. And then we have dry fruits. We have follicles um, and we have a keen. So follicles are gonna split open and a keens are not. So that's just showing some of the diversity here within the rosaceae. Um, similar thing, showing some of our most important cultivated things, plums, peaches, apples, strawberries, raspberries with some different depictions. Um, I should say in Colorado, I don't know if a lot of you know this, but on the west slope of Colorado, kind of nearing the Utah state line, we actually have a very important um, peach industry. Um, lots of really beautiful uh, apricots as well are in that group. And it's my greatest joy when those come into fruit in the summer. A late season freeze can take out these flowers and kind of ruin the crop for the year. So we hope that doesn't happen this year. Okay, so here's some examples for you. This is nine bark Physocarpus opulifolius, um, which is kind of a you know mid elevation woody species here, and it would have little follicle fruits. So perigynous, a short little hypanthium around it, like a cereal bowl. And those um, fruits are going to open at maturity. Okay, so now we'll consider the rosoidae here in which you have many carpels that are um, separate and fused to each, not to each other, so separate. Um, and the hypanthium is well-developed Sometimes you get a very fleshy receptacle, like in strawberry, which is shown on the right here. And that's, again, what's going to puff out and be the, the fleshy heart of what actually then becomes the stro strawberry fruit. The actual fruits of a strawberry are one-seeded akenes. So like the little seeds, as you think of on strawberries, those are each a fruit, but it never pops open. So it's an akene. Uh, herbs with compound leaves are what we see in Fergaria, etc. And those have those above ground runners, also known as stolons, that allow for kind of clonal propagation of strawberries. Um, so that's showing kind of the progression of strawberry development there. And then in Rubus, which is the genus for raspberries and blackberries, what you have is the fleshy carpal of all of those individual akenes aggregating, kind of gluing together on the outside into a druplet. Okay, so that's from one flower, right? Lots of separate pistils that when the carpels flesh out, they kind of secondarily glue together. And we have native species of raspberries here in Colorado, as well as strawberries. Okay, so there's one of our wild strawberries, Fragaria virginiana, which I think is actually far more tasty than domesticated, but really hard to find. Here's an example of a local species with dry fruits. So Akeens, Guillaume triflorum prairie smoke um, in fruit. It has this be beautiful smoky quality that's quite lovely. Huge group are the potentillas, these kind of yellow catch-all looking little flowers, um, very small to the big kind of shrubby one, Potentella fruticosa, that um, people plant horticulturally. Um, they're quite lovely. Um, it's a hard group to learn and to key out. There's quite a few species of them. The true roses is the genus Rosa. Um, two of the most common species here in Colorado are the prickly rose, uh, which is used medicinally and ceremonially by the Shoshone people, uh, as well as the smooth rose, lacking really nasty prickles like the other one has. Um, I should say, too, in general, that the rose hip, again, the mature fruit of the genus Rosa, is a really important food source for bears, lots of other things. It is used 
medicinally, um, very, very high in vitamin C. So good to make a tea out of. Okay, now let's consider cherries here. So we again have one pistil in the center and it is composed of one carpicle. So it's called monocarpic. And then the hypanthium is, is coming up all around it. So it's again, kind of a cereal bowl perigynous. And this is what we're seeing in the flower right here. Okay. So a very specific fruit type then is a drupe in which the outermost part of the carpal is very fleshy, but then there's an inner part of the carpal that forms the bony seed. So if you're, you know, you've ever had a plum or a cherry, you know, that pit, it can come out. Now, next time you have one, try and cut it in half. It's very hard to do. You might need a nutcracker, but you will see, right? And again, if you've ever shelled a uh, um, almond, same thing. Almonds are in this group. Um, you will see there's an outermost bony part that is carpal, and then there's the true seed to the interior. Um, so one of the most important local species, Prunus, Prunus virginiana, is the choke cherry um, that we see has very kind of classic rosaceae flower going on. And then the beautiful um, inflorescences full of those little droops, the cherries. Um, very important, again, for bears, a major component of bear scat, etc. Now, prunuses, they actually have simple leaves. And a key feature to look for is right at the base of the leaf blade along the petiole, you often get a couple little bumps or glands. I'll try and show you that in the field, but that's one of the very best ways to know the genus Prunus. And finally, we have the true apples. Um, Malice is the genus that um, uh, Jen Ackerfield uses. Most of the malices that you find in Colorado, they often can give you a clue um, if they're in what appears to be a natural area today, it's probably once was a homestead. So people planted apples all across Western North America. There's the whole Johnny Appleseed thing, the whole story about um, people essentially drinking like low grade apple cider, alcoholic apple cider as a water substitute to avoid getting, you know, waterborne diseases because it actually would have had alcohol in it. That was a major thing in the pioneer days. Um, so there's a lot of old apple groves planted across the United States. And again, this group, unlike the others, is actually going to have fused carpels and an inferior gynoecium with the hypanthium pressed along the side. And that again is what's going to form the outside of the palm fruit. Delightful. Okay, now we switch gears to another massive family, much bigger than the rosaceae actually, the fabulous fabaceae or the legumes. This is in the top like 10 most species rich families in the entire world, um, literally globally found um, lots of these are tropical trees, the giant genus Acacia is one of them, um, but we have a lot here um, in the temperate as well. Trees, shrubs, everything. Very diagnostic fruit form called the legume that we're going to talk about. This is a group again with nodules in the roots to house the symbiotic bacteria rhizobia, which fixes atmospheric nitrogen into the precursor forms that um, plants can use to build amino acids. We owe them a lot. They're delicious. I eat beans pretty much every single day. Um, and I bet a lot of you do as well. Okay, so three features of legumes. Each flower has a single carpal and it is superior, okay? Monocarpic, single superior carpal. And these are like beautiful side views in of some peas. A single superior carpal sewed on both sides, meaning two lines of suture, is called a legume. So it is a modified follicle, follicle ugh, 
with two lines of suture. So again, if you've ever had snap peas or beans, you know, there's kind of a top string and a bottom string. So that is what a legume is. That is what defines the family. So they can get kind of crazy like you see here. And I'll show you some of my tropical legumes from um, Southern Mexico that I have. Um, for the most part, and again, there's always exceptions. These are compound leaves um, and alternate, never opposite. Some are simple, including the red bud, which is a beloved tree of North America that actually has simple leaves. But most of our herbs are gonna be some form of compound. Now they could be trifoliate like clover, pinnately compound or palmately compound like the lupine that we'll see. Okay, now there's three broad groups of legumes. One is huge in Colorado. Um, this is kind of a, a small second, the sesalpinoid legumes. Some of these groups are like all you find in various parts of the world. So sesalpinoid legumes, uh, again, they're gonna have a base of five uh, and an androecium of 10. And again, a superior gynecium made of one carpal. Now the stamens are gonna be unequal. So you see some are shooting out, some are very short. And there are very specific names for petals in legumes, banners, wings, and keels. So the very topmost one towards the sky is going to be the banner. And on the side, there are going to be two lateral, also known as wing petals, but it lacks the keel that we're about to see. Um, we have some examples of some sesalpinoid legumes to share with you. I don't think there are mm, any of these in Colorado, but I include it because this is critical in lots of other parts of the world, the mimosoid legumes. We'll see some of these at Denver Botanical Garden. This group has really minimized the calyx and the corolla and maximized the number of stamen to create these powder puff inflorescences. Uh, and they make these like bottle brush looking structures. They could often be really showy. So the stamen are doing the bulk of the visual display. And there's fusion at the base of that whole structure. Now, yeah, these are, just kind of a different way of recruiting in animal pollinators. And we see a lot of this in the tropics, but not in Colorado. What we do see in Colorado is faboid legumes, okay? And these have a very strong pea-like look. So if you've ever grown sweet peas or beans, this is what those flowers look like. We're gonna dissect them so you have that in your mind. So extraordinarily zygomorphic starting with the calyx, which is often very fused. But I thought you said it was a rosid. Yes, yes, there's generally not much fusion, but we do see some. So the calyx is often fused. And now we have a very obvious banner. So in this case, this is that yellow there. Then we have two wings off to the side. And then there are two keel petals that are sewed together like a little canoe at the bottom. So the keel is gonna be a really important structure to be able to always find with a faboid legume. The tip of the keel, how it looks, is it standing up? Is it notched? Is it rounded? It's going to be a critical thing to note to distinguish between some of our most troubling and species rich groups here in Colorado. Now inside the little canoe is going to be the Androecium and the gynecium kind of knit inside of there. The top is not sewed shut, so it is truly like a little canoe. Okay, so get kind of that banner wing keel for the faboid legumes that we see all over Colorado. Ooh. Okay, so one other thing to get comfortable with looking at whenever you see a faboid legume, you're going to want to dissect down a flower and look at the stamens. So there's gonna be 10 stamens and there's kind of two different ways that they can be arranged. All of the bases of the filaments can be fused together. That would be called monodelphus. Or this is kind of weird. You can have a situation like this, which is called diadelphus. So nine are fused and then there's one just kind of all by itself hanging out on top. I don't know why. 
but it's a key feature to distinguishing different groups of legumes. So diadelphus versus monadelphus. Okay, some of our local Fabaceae, giant genus Lupinus, the lupines. We get these in the alpine and wetlands of the montane. You get these down in sagebrush, grasslands. There's so many different species. They're found in the Andes. They're really a successful lineage in the new world. Um, palmately compound leaves and terminal inflorescences. I think most of them are um, um, racemes, I think, but I'm not sure about that. And then two extraordinarily large genera. So if you look at Flora of Colorado at the very beginning on page, meh, where are we? Page 14, Jen lists out the largest genera in the state. And Carex is number one. Ew, we'll talk about that later. But the second one is Astragalus. And... Um, yeah, I guess Oxytropus didn't make the list. But at any rate, this is like one of the biggest ones. There are 117 species in Colorado of Astragalus, 115 of which are native. And there's quite a few Oxytropus as well. So when we see little herbaceous Fabaceae that are native, um, it's probably going to be one of these two things, as long as it's not a vine. Uh, I plunked in all of my indigenous uh, database knowledge about these, and I want you to see there's tons of medicinal and ceremonial uses of different species by the Navajo in particular, as well as the Shoshone and Arapaho people. Now, what I will say is uh, Oxytropus in particular, one of its common names is loca weed, but also Astragalus. They produce lots of different secondary compounds, which can be toxic to animals. Um, people that go into rangeland management, or if you're going to raise horses or cattle or whatever, you need to learn how to identify these plants because in certain areas, particularly low, you know, areas that have been overgrazed, in which the animals have removed most of the grasses, if they go to this as like a next source of food. Um, the first thing that you'll probably see is that if you have a pregnant horse or cow, they're probably going to lose the baby. It's abortification um, from these secondary compounds, and they can actually die or appear to go crazy. So that's what loco weed means. So being able to identify these is pretty darn important. Now, the key split to figuring out which genus it is, is again to look at the keel tip. And over here, I couldn't really get a very good picture of this, but over here, this is an oxytropus. Here's the keel. And can you see that I'm mousing over? There's a little lip. So imagine like a key, a canoe with like a fancy, like kind of like Venice gondolier, like end to it. That'd be oxytropus. Astragalus is going to be just smooth with no little lip or even a little notch in it. So those are things we can look at in the field to tell them apart. Um, some non-native things that you're going to see all over and that are important are things like clovers and alfalfas. So melilotus, the sweet clover, trifolium, the red clover, and medicago, sativa, alfalfa. These are native to Eurasia. Um, various people brought them over often as a cover crop. So one major cropping system, right, is one year you're going to plant something of high value that uses up all of the available nitrogen in the field. So something like corn in particular, right? Then the next year you might alternate with a cover crop in the fab AC. Why? Well, because of that nitrogen fixing capability. So alternating with a cover crop is going to bring back in some uh, nutrients to the soil. Um, so that's one of many reasons. This is also very important fodder for livestock. So these are good, unlike oxytropus, they're not going to poison. So a lot of the fodder that you buy for large ungulates is going to be in this group. Now, many of these have gone feral. They're kind of weeds all over. They're not nasty weeds. You just see them around a lot. And you got to look close and you're going to see that classic faboid leg. You look to them. 
And finally, just a couple other fun families in the Fabid clade, the Linaceae, which includes flax. We have them to see in class, beautiful blue flowers, the source of the um, textile flax, as well as linseed oil, a really great way to get omega-3s if you are vegetarian in particular, as well as what they used to make linoleum out of. And then the cucurbitaceae family, which includes pumpkins, gourds, cucumbers, zucchini, etc. Most of these are going to be climbing vines. Uh, unisexual flowers. So this is a female-only flower um, at the end of a cucumber, a zucchini that's going to fall off eventually. Um, so you have to have both a male and a female individual of these to get fruit. So I, uh, in college. <laughs> We planted a pumpkin vine in our dorm room, don't ask, um, but it turns out we had a male only individual and so there was just no way we were going to get a pumpkin and that was something I learned very early and I was very proud of that botanical fact. Uh, there are some wild species like Echinocystis, the wild cucumber that hopefully we'll get to see, as well as the buffalo gourd. Um, and that is all I've got for now. And now I'm going to do the thing where I try really hard to figure out how to end the Zoom once I made all the Zoom controls go away. So you leave. Leave me to my madness. How do I end this? Oh, my goodness. End the meeting. Stop recording.